and condom dropping. Thank you. Uh, terahertz spectroscopy and devices, of course, and magnetic spectroscopy and ultra fast and quantum optics. So, uh, besides his research, he also made multiple uh, education programs for undergrad students from the US or to the US. And one of, I am one of the students uh, benefited from this program. And uh, this is, uh, this initiated my interest in studying in, in the US actually. Okay, so then today he's going to tell us about his uh, recent, recent research on the cavity induced ultra strong light matter interaction in uh, various material systems today. So please uh, go ahead, Jun. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Great pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to see Hota here. Yeah, I've known him for many, many years. Uh, so I, I will talk about our recent work on. Uh, Cavity, cavity QED, uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, which is traditionally a topic of quantum optics, and it deals with the interaction of atoms with cavity photons. And the theory of cavity QED is extremely well developed and well established, and one can make very precise uh, uh, predictions. And depending <coughs> on what kind of initial state you can get, uh, you can uh, produce single photon generation, atom photon entanglement, and quantum transduction, uh, which can be useful for quantum technology. What I will talk about today is uh, the condensed matter version of cavity QED. Instead of atoms, molecules, replace a piece of material, okay? semiconductors, magnets, superconductors, inside the cavity to, to probe the influence of the cavity or cavity photons on the properties of the, of the material. And there are many reasons why this can be interesting and, and useful. Number one, Compared to atomic and molecular systems, condensed matter systems have various resonances and transitions that have huge dipole moments. So they interact much more strongly with, with light. Uh, therefore, uh, this allows us to go into new regimes of light matter interactions, the so called ultra strong light matter coupling. Second, Unlike atoms and molecules, we have many, many interacting electrons that leads to many body effects. And in particular, I will talk about one particular many body process, uh, the cooperative enhancement of couples. So that when you have a collection of atoms, uh, two level atoms, they can cooperate in, in interaction with, with light. There leads to huge. Uh, light, uh, enhancement of light matter interaction. Third, the ground state of a condensed matter system couples strongly with with uh, with cavity photons uh, contain a large number of photons. These photons are vir virtual vacuum photons, uh, or corresponding to the zero point fields. Uh, this, this will be the main point of this talk. So cavities, when you have a cavity, you have a set of photonic modes. And by fine adjusting the cavity length, uh, one can make, uh, make the, uh, one of the photonic frequencies equal to or nearly equal to a certain transition or resonance in the matter side. So cavities allow us to study resonant light matter coupling. That's obvious. Second, cavities uh, enhance, cavities confine light. 
and confined light has enhanced electric fields, electromagnetic fields, which leads to strong, stronger light matter interaction compared to free space. So um, I'll be mostly talking about the so-called strong coupling regime, where the original identities of light and matter are lost. Okay, so we, we have so-called polaritons, hybrid, light matter hybrids. The light matter coupling rate is higher than any other rate in the system. So the dynamics of the system are completely governed by light matter interaction. In terms of uh, uh, parameters, uh, this strong coupling regime is defined by this inequality. On the left hand side, we have we have 2G. G is the light matter coupling rate. Uh, gamma and kappa are decay rates. We have two decay rates, photon decay rate and matter decay rate. The photon decay rate is related to, related to the Q factor. And so the, the photons confined in the cavity can eventually decay out of the uh, leak out of the cavity. So the, the, the larger the kappa, the smaller the Q, Q factor, quality factor. Gamma is related to the scaling rate, decoherence, and phase destroying scaling processes, and which can be very, very fast in, in condensed matter systems. But the, together, kappa and gamma will give you a certain line width. But as long as the light matter coupling rate exceeds the decay rates, we can, we can start seeing Rabi oscillations, coherent Rabi oscillations in the time domain, which corresponds to the energy exchange back and forth between light, the light and matter systems. And if you Fourier transform the Rabi oscillations into the frequency domain, we see Rabi splitting. And we have polaritons, and the original resonance, the emission or absorption splits into two, uh, into the upper polariton and the lower polariton. So the separation between the two is the uh, Rabi split. Um, I will talk about various uh, material systems, but always our light uh, uh, is in the terahertz frequency range. Uh, the photon frequency is between 0 0.1 and 10 terahertz. One terahertz is four milliEV, if you are more comfortable with EV. Uh, in terms of wavelength, it's from three millimeters is to three, uh, 30 microns. Sometimes this is called the technology gap. The terahertz technology gap is too high for electronics and too low for photonics. So the, uh, there's mature technology, both on the high frequency electronic side on the uh, photonic side, near infrared and mid infrared. But there's a clear gap in, in, in the terahertz range, technologically speaking. But scientifically speaking, this is the richest frequency range for condensed matter physics. Let's take a semiconductor with, with three carriers, and you, you apply a magnetic field, you have both the uh, orbital motion and the spin precession, and the both such dynamics, electron spin resonance and cyclotron resonance occur in the terahertz frequency range if you apply a magnetic field of a few tesla. If you have a semiconductor quantum structure, confined structure, such as quantum wells, quantum wires, and quantum dots, inter subban transitions occur in the terahertz frequency range. And further, there are many collective excitations including plasmons, phonons, magnons, and superconducting gap excitations. So all these transitions and resonances occur in the terahertz range, and they have huge oscillator strength, dipole moments. So they, they couple strongly with, with light. And we have various techniques to, to make cavities um, some, some of these cavities are dielectric based and others are based on 
metals, so there are pros and cons and in terms of the Q factor and the field of confinement. And some of these cavities are zero dimensional, meaning that light is confined in all three dimensions. But some of these are one dimensional, so the light is confined only in one directions. But there are many, many uh, different types of cavities uh, available in, in the, in the uh, terahertz range. But this uh, the terahertz cavity QED uh, allows us to go into a, like, an unusual regime of light matter coupling, which is impossible to achieve in atomic and molecular systems. This is the so-called ultra strong coupling regime where the Rabi splitting is comparable to or sometimes larger than the resonance frequency itself. This is very uh, uh, non-intuitive because it's basically you have you have two oscillators light and matter oscillating at omega omega naught okay and G is the rate at which energy is exchanged between between light and matter. When G becomes larger than omega omega naught, this means that the energy is exchanged faster than even one one cycle of the original uh, light and matter oscillations. So in this in this regime, many of the standard approximations break down. For example, the rotating wave approximation, the dipole approximation and even the two level approximation breaks down so when you have other states all, all, all the states become important because the light matter coupling is so strong so theory theoretical calculations are very very challenging in this in this regime so experiment experiments guide uh, theorists in, in, in this regime of, of ultra strong light matter coupling so the, the important parameter is the ratio between g and omega naught so we, we use this from the eta theta which is the ratio between g and omega naught so the light matter coupling rate divided by the resonance frequency if you look at the history of cavity qed uh, as long as you're using atomic and molecular systems g is so small um, so the G over in terms of this parameter, even even now the this parameter is, is on the order of 10, ten to the minus six. But if you if you use condensed matter systems, so the first cavity QED in condensed matter systems uh, was uh, micro cavity exciton polaritons uh, by Arakawa and Westbush. So that was already ten to the minus three. Then the, uh, there are many other condensed matter systems, quantum uh, superconducting qubits, quantum dots, inter subband polaritons, and electron cyclotron resonance. They can be much, much higher than atomic and molecular systems. And once this parameter becomes larger than 10%, then you start seeing uh, the effects of the breakdown of the rotating wave approximation. Non intuitive. Lightman interaction effects start appearing when when this parameter becomes larger than 10 percent and this is the definition of the ultra strong coupling regime and some experimental groups have achieved further the deep strong coupling regime where the where this parameter is larger than one and these experimental demonstrations include uh, superconducting qubits Transmon qubits, um, yeah, cyclotron resonance system or Landau polaritons, and plasmonic nano uh, particle systems. So they they have reported uh, the values of eta larger than one. Uh, within my group, we are using phonons in, in one uh, project uh, in lead telluride and lead tin telluride. Uh, there are soft Phonon modes, very uh, 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 optically active phonons in the terahertz range, and we have achieved a value of 1.25. Why this is important? Why this is exciting? Let me 
explain one particular scenario where this this kind of ultra strong coupling can lead to a new new phenomenon or new phase. Okay, this is called the super radiant phase transition. Suppose we are in the strong coupling regime, ultra strong coupling regime, um, but still G is smaller than omega naught. So here the, the middle, so this is a lower polariton, this is an upper polariton, the separation between the two is 2G, um, but G is still lower than omega naught. But if you increase the G, light matter coupling, to make G equal to omega naught, what happens is the lower polariton frequency becomes zero because the center frequency is omega naught and the, this energy separation is G. So at this critical light matter coupling strength, the energy of the lower polariton becomes zero. And if you keep increasing the light matter coupling strength, when G becomes larger than omega naught, the frequency of the lower polariton becomes negative, which is impossible. This means that the, the simple theory breaks down. So there's a, an instability in the system uh, in terms of light matter interaction. In fact, Hepp and Lieb in 1973 uh, pointed out that there's a new phase, new phase uh, as a function of light matter coupling strength. So they constructed this phase diagram. Uh, the y-axis is normalized temperature. It, Kt divided by the, the cavity uh, energy. And this is temperature. And this is the normalized coupling strength. Um, so as you can see, there's a new phase predicted. It's called the super radiant phase, which exists above a certain threshold, which is temperature dependent. But it, it's important to note that this phase transition occurs even at t equals zero. So there's a quantum phase transition at t equals zero. So you go from a normal state, normal phase into a new new phase, the, the so-called super radiant phase. So what happens when you enter this, this phase? There are two order parameters in this quantum phase transition. Again, at t equals zero, with, with no external driving. Okay, so this is just, you have a collection of two level atoms inside the cavity with no external driving. Okay? So the atomic inversion should be zero because at t equals zero, all the two level atoms should be in the ground state. But as soon as you enter this phase, atomic inversion becomes finite. Second, the number of photons in the cavity, which was supposed to be zero because we're not externally driving the system, becomes finite. So this means that the, uh, once you enter this exotic phase of, of ultra strong coupling, at t equals zero, with completely in the dark, no, 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 no external driving, you have, you have excited atoms, combination of excited atoms, and virtual photons in, in, the, in the ground state. So this was the statement made by uh, Hepp and Lieb in 1973, and the, there have been more, more recent theoretical papers to talk about this quantum phase transition equal zero. So, oh, yeah? Yes, sir. to just ask one question. Yes. So in the, this right panel, if you enter the super radiant phase, yes. so this photon exists with, uh, let's say, above uh, G over omega naught is larger than one is kind of a, a vacuum fluctuation of the photon field. Yes. Yeah. So yes. that's the source, right? Yes. Okay. So the these are still virtual photons. Mm -hmm. They were taken from the quantum vacuum, mm -hmm. and this through the communication between the matter and the quantum vacuum that was made possible through the cavity. Which enhance the light matter coupling. I see. Yes. And if you're looking at those pictures, it looks like you can tune G. How do you tune G? How do you control it? Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about G. So G is determined by by the uh, 
or light metal coupling dipole dipole moment. In, in the case of electric dipole excitation, it's just mu one two. So if you have a two level atom, the matrix element be, between between the two. But in in condensed matter systems, that basically tells you the strength of, of light matter interaction, phonons or magnons, or how how they interact with with light. But then the, the, the G is determined by that portion product of that and the electric field or the vacuum fluctuating fields, which is related to the mode volume of the cavity. The, when we shrink the shrink the, the cavity mode cavity volume, the electric field is enhanced. So the electric field and the dipole moment that the product of the two determines G. However, only two years after the original prediction, there's a counter counter argument, theoretical study saying that the no, it's impossible. This phase transition should not occur. Okay? So this was the point of, the, of this was in the original head and leap paper, they did not include the so-called A squared term in the Hamiltonian, in the light matter. Hamiltonian. So the, this simply comes from the expansion of this. So P is replaced by P plus E A. So A is the vector potential. You present in the electromagnetic fields and it's expanded. First time you get is A dot P. So A dot P in the Coulomb gauge. So this is just the E, e dot P. So the, the dipole, electric dipole interaction. So this is the usual light matter interaction term. And usually you, you, you ignore this, so that the, this extra term, which is proportional to the, eight, uh, the square of the vector potential. And if you include this term, it turns out that the, the energy of the lower polarity <coughs> never crosses zero as a function of the light matter coupling strength. It asymptotically approaches zero as a function of g over omega naught. So this is, this is known as the no-go theorem of the uh, super radiant phase transition. This was supposed to be the end of this discussion, but it turns out that this was the beginning of many years of uh, discussions, <laughs> debates <laughs> among, among theorists. So they, they started talking about the, the conditions for this no-go no theorem appears yeah i mean some of this I mean, they're all uh, the well-known theorists they, they they argued with each other in 1970s and even 2004 2007 2014 2014 2018 <laughs> 2019 2000. so so now they're talking about because in the ultra strong coupling regime many of the standard approximations break down so if you're not careful you you even lose the gauge invariance. Of course, you have you have to have gauge invariance. But if you're not careful, you, you lose gauge, gauge invariance, gauge in ambiguities. And more recent uh, papers, yeah, 2019, all these very recent theoretical papers, they're suggesting ways to uh, uh, avoid circumvent the no-go theorem so that one can achieve the super radiant. Phase transition. So I want to uh, uh, yeah, highlight this. So we we found a new magnetic system uh, which has an analogy to the light matter coupling system. So the instead of photon atom coupling, we have magnon spin coupling. So the role of photons is played by magnons, and the role of two level atoms is played by spins. In a, in a certain anti-thermagnetic insulator, and we, we have spectroscopic evidence that we, we have a magnonic version of the Dickey superradiant uh, phase transition. And this is, this is one of the many systems that we are working on right now. So we, we have many uh, polaritonic systems that we're working on in the strong and ultra-strong coupling regime, including Lando polaritons, exciton polaritons, Zeeman polaritons, magnon polaritons, and phonon polaritons. All these are 
polaricons in the sense that the boson uh, in, in, in these systems are, are, are photons. Okay, so the photon, photons are participating. But we also have spin magnon system, magnon magnon system, plasmon plasma system. They don't even include photons. Right? So these are other unusual uh, plus, uh, polaritonic systems. And the, whenever we do these experiments, what, what we, look, we look for are anti-crossing. So anti-crossing as a function of uh, detuning. So my students dance whenever they, they find anti-crossing. So what Elijah is showing, small detuning in this regime, large detuning. So the detuning is, is very important. The detuning is a, is a frequency difference between the original matter frequency and the original uh, photon frequency. So the detuning delta determines the, the Rabi splitting. So the Rabi splitting within the simple James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, the, the Rabi splitting depends on three parameters, G, delta, and N. So G is the most important parameter which we want to maximize, which is the coupling rate. Delta is the detuning that I just introduced. And the interesting N here is the number of photons inside the cavity. So the more photons we have, the larger the, the, the Rabi splitting, right? But we want to go to the other limit where N is zero. You notice that even when N is zero and delta is zero, this expression gives you a finite Rabi splitting. This is called the ohm resonance vacuum Rabi splitting. Omega zero zero is 2G. Okay, so this vacuum Rabi splitting is very, very significant because what is the, the material coupled with even in the absence of photons? Vacuum. So this is due to the fact that the vacuum or the quantum vacuum is not empty space. It is filled of, it is full of fluctuating electromagnetic fields or virtual photons corresponding to the zero point energy one half times h bar omega okay? so the existence of such zero point field was already noted or speculated by Planck, einstein stern and Nurse, but firmly uh, confirmed or predicted by dirac in, in 1927 and according to modern quantum field theory any any field any quantum field should have zero point energies or zero point fields and especially in the case of electromagnetic field it's very straightforward when you quantize electromagnetic fields you start from classical electromagnetism or electro uh, dynamics and you have electric field magnetic field they're both related to the vector potential and the, you know, this is the classical vector potential, and this is the total energy, E squared plus V squared, and then you quantize this. And then the, the, prompt, the, the uh, uh, coefficients alpha and alpha star becomes operators, A and A dagger. So both the electric field and the magnetic field become operators. But in the end, what you find is a simple harmonic oscillator. Right, so the simple harmonic, a simple harmonic oscillator has this zero point energy that we, as we know, one, one and a half. So the, uh, the electric field, both magnetic field, if you sandwich the electric field and the magnetic field operators with a zero, the vacuum, vacuum state is zero because the electric and magnetic fields are fluctuating and oscillating around zero. So the, the fields are zero. But if you take square, square, then it's, it's, it's fine. Okay. So this is due to the zero point fluctuation fields. And the existence of such zero point fields, fluctuating electromagnetic fields, has been verified through many different experiments. And in, in fact, 
behind some of the most fascinating, interesting uh, phenomena in, in, in nature, spontaneous emission, when you have an excited atom, the excited atom can decay radiatively through interaction with, with the, the vacuum uh, fluctuation fields. The Casimir force, when you have of two metallic plates uh, uh, closely placed, and they have attractive force uh, proportional to one over d, d to the fourth. The Arnold Davis effect, when you have a photo detector, and it, it, it's the photo detector moves at a constant acceleration, you start seeing photons due to the interaction with the uh, uh, vacuum, the lamp shift. The 2s state and the 2p state of a hydrogen atom has a finite, very small splitting through interaction with the, the quantum vacuum. On the Wall's forces, when you have two polarizable uh, molecules due to the, the uh, interaction with the fluctuating vacuum fields, they both show fluctuating uh, dipole moments and they interact with, between each other. Electrons are almost magnetic moment. The G factor of a free electron in vacuum is not precisely equal to two. There's a small deviation uh, from two. And all these are due to the existence of vacuum zero point fields. But such zero point fields are usually very, very small. One has to work very hard to observe such, <coughs> such fields, such uh, effects. For example, the Lamb shift which was uh, uh, observed first by uh, Lamb and Rutherford. And they had to work very, very hard to, to observe this very, very small shift due to the absorption and re-emission re of virtual photons in hydrogen atom. And there are small deviations between theory and experiment in, in the g-factor of, 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 of an electron. So such measurements can provide a stringent test of the theory of quantum electrodynamics. So they're typically very small, but if you think about this, the quantum vacuum has a lot of energy. It has a continuum of spectrum, the photonic density of states, which is simply given by this. It has actually an infinite energy. If you, if you go to infinite frequency. Of course, this kind of theory may break down when you go to such, such high frequencies. But if you stay at low energies, then you, you, we have a very precise uh, equation to, to tell us what kind of energy we have uh, from the, the vacuum zero point uh, fields. So from omega 1 to omega 2, this is the expression that tells us how much energy we have. And in the visible range, we have 22 joules per cubic meters. That's a lot of energy we have. So we should try to take advantage of the existence of such zero-point quantum vacuum fields to do something useful for us. And we already know one very specific example. Uh, it's called the Purcell effect. So here the uh, the spontaneous emission rate is enhanced once you, you have a cavity which has a resonance, which has a photonic mode, which coincides with the, uh, the transition energy. This makes sense, right? Because the, the spontaneous emission rate is, is due to its interaction with the surrounding electromagnetic fields. And if you modify the, the environment, if you modify the surrounding photonic density of states around the, around the atom, you, you, can, you can change the, the, the spontaneous emission. So in, in, in the case of the Purcell effect, you intentionally tune the cavity so that the, uh, one of the photonic modes coincides with the transition frequency. That's why, you, so there will be a peak in the dens photonic density of states that coincides with the with the transition frequency so the in the presence of the cavity the spont spontaneous emission rate is enhanced but we can also do the opposite one can inhibit spontaneous emission by removing photonic density of states at the transition energy 
you have an excited atom and then if you have a cavity you are introducing new uh, boundary conditions to remove the photonic density of states at that particular frequency then the excited atom will be excited forever it, it doesn't decay okay. so the electromagnetic environments engineering so engineering cavity engineering uh, can lead to very interesting uh, optical phenomena. So there are lots of uh, motivations and hints coming from atomic uh, physics. So the, within this field, this, this burgeoning field of uh, condensed matter cavity QED, we are asking the following questions. Well, so the main question is, can we modify and control a material properties just by placing it in a cavity right so we're changing the electromagnetic environment compared to, so you have a material in free, in free space just by placing it in a cavity can we expect anything in the that way again we're not driving anything just we're just changing the environment of the of, 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 of the material can we change material properties for example can we modify electrical conductivity with vacuum photons which would correspond to lightless photoconductivity can we increase the transition temperature of a superconductor just by placing it in a, in a cavity <clears throat> can we modify the topology of an electron band using circularly polarized cavity vacuum fields and uh, most excitingly from, from condensed matter point of view can we create or destroy phases of matter using engineered vacuum fields so these are the questions we are we're trying to address experimentally because theorists are ahead of us so they're making some wild predictions uh, they're very optimistic <laughs> that things should, should happen yeah, superconductors and mag ferromagnets, anti ferromagnets, and uh, ferroelectrics. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're predict predicting phenomena for materials placed in cavities just by relying on vacuum fields. So, uh, my group is an experimental group, and we are studying ultra strong coupling phenomena in materials and we we have been seeing very very obvious very large vacuum effects such as huge vacuum rubby splittings on the order of the of the resonance and the vacuum block Seagot shift uh, which tells us that the, the rotating wave approximation uh, uh, is, is broken so the uh, for an experimentalist, what we are looking for is, is a system which shows, which has a large G. So G is, is a product of, of a matter pro property and the yeah, cavity property. So the, we are always looking for a material that has a large dipole moment. And we always design our, our cavity so that the vacuum field is enhanced. So typically this is, this is achieved by shrinking the volume of the, of, of, the, of the cavity. We also have a particular advantage using condensed matter systems. There's a particular system, uh, process of Dickey cooperativity. When you have a collection of two-level atoms, let's say N, N two-level atoms, and if they all interact with a single mode of electromagnetic fields, then the, the light matter interaction is enhanced uh, proportion, in proportion to the square root of, of the number of, uh, of atoms. But in condensed matter systems, we, we have many, many, many atoms. So we can take advantage of this cooperative uh, enhancement. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? Yes. 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so in, in the rest of the talk, I want to talk about three different material systems. They're very different. In the first uh, section, I will talk about the quantum Hall effect. 
quantum Hall systems, uh, high mobility two dimensional electron gas in, in a perpendicular magnetic field, and then we, we, we create so called Landau polar tunnels. In the second part, I will talk about steam photon coupling in a, in a paramagnet. So here we have a collection of paramagnetic spins. Um, and the third, I will talk about a BCS superconductor in a, in a, in a cavity. All these happen in a, in a terahertz cavity. Okay, so the London polaritons emerge um, as a result of strong coupling uh, between 2D electrons and terahertz cavity photons. So we, we place a 2D, two dimensional electron gas, in a, in a terahertz cavity. And we apply a perpendicular magnetic field, which lambda quantizes uh, the system. So the system is is uh, Fermi degenerate. There's a well-defined Fermi energy, and in, in the presence of a magnetic field, we have few lambda levels and empty lambda levels. And the transition, optical transition that we're interested in is the one from the highest occupied lambda level, let's say the nth lambda level, to the lowest empty lambda level, n plus one lambda level. So the selection rule is such that the, we can couple between uh, adjacent lambda levels, so n to n plus one. And the frequency between, between the nth and n plus one level is given by omega c cyclotron frequency which is proportion to be so just by changing the magnetic field we can change the matter resonance frequency in terms of cavity we're using a one-dimensional photonic crystal cavity consisting of silicon and vacuum so silicon vacuum silicon vacuum so we, we repeat these and the well so the, the, the photonic crystal means that you have a periodic structure but then you, you introduce a defect, you remove the central layer that will produce a defect level within the photonic crystal cavity that will act as a, as a the cavity resonance. Um, so, for example, within the terahertz, so we, we work in the terahertz range. Uh, within this range, we have three photonic band gaps one, two, three, and within. Within each photonic band gap, we have a very sharp uh, resonance or photonic mode. Right? Um, yeah, so the, the Q factor is between 100 and 1000. Uh, so here, the, yeah, basically, the, the, the frequency range is the terahertz, a few terahertz, and the, the line width is a few gigahertz. So that's why the, the uh, uh, yeah, the Q factor is on the order of uh, uh, 1,000, up to 1,000. The, the cavity photon uh, lifetime is on the order of 70 picoseconds. The cavity finesse is on the order of 100. And what we do is we place our material inside this one dimension of Fermi crystal cavity. And in this case, we apply a magnetic field. And this is done in a magneto optical cryostat. And then we come in with very weak terahertz radiation to study the linear response of the system. We would emphasize that it's, it's, it's very, very weak. You know, the, this terahertz radiation is used only as a probe. So the ultra strong coupling is already happening inside the, the, the cavity. And we often circularly polarize the terahertz radiation. This is important because the magnetic field breaks the time reversal symmetry. So the, the electrons are moving only in one direction, cyclotron motion. So the sense of circular polarization of the probe beam is very, very important. And these are experimental transmission spectra taken at various magnetic fields from minus three Tesla to three Tesla. All these traces are vertically offset intentionally to show you the evolution of the two polariton modes as a function of magnetic field. This is the upper polariton mode. 
this is the lower polarity mode. Omega zero, omega naught is that the cavity frequency, which is which is constant as a function of magnetic field. Omega C is the cyclotron frequency, which is the matter frequency, which is changing linearly with the magnetic field. So in the absence of interaction, they should cross here. Crossing should occur exactly at this zero determining point. But in the presence of interaction, we see anti-crossing. Anti-crossing is the upper polarity and lower polarity. There's a huge, huge vacuum rabbi splitting. So as you can see, the, the splitting, so the energy difference between here and here is 2G. So 2G is from here to here. But the line width is very, very narrow. This is both due to the high quality factor of the cavity and the ultra high mobility of the of the two day so the gamma and kappa are on the order of the line width but this is the light matter coupling so the the so-called cooperativity factor is 3513 which is a record high number in the in cavity 2d and 2g of omega naught so this is 72 percent so we are in the ultra strong uh, coupling regime uh, the most important Part of this is the so the incident light probe light is certainly polarized and when the magnetic is field is positive so the electrons and protons are rotating in the same direction so we do expect coupling but CRI means that the electrons and protons are rotating in the opposite directions so the, we don't expect any any coupling but we do see this splitting Okay, what was the last split? This shift from the, the cavity frequency. This is direct evidence that the rotating wave approximation breaks down. Let me go back to the very, very basic uh, 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 Hamiltonian, uh, the so called JC Hamiltonian, James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, which had matter, matter turn, the light turn and the interaction so the interaction term sigma plus a and sigma minus a this means this is one photon is destroyed and the matter is excited so this is absorption this is a dagger sigma minus which means the matter is de-excited one photon comes out so it's emission so everything is physical okay, but this is written in the so-called rotating wave approximation. In reality, there are, there are additional terms, the so-called counter-rotating terms, which are counterintuitive because it's sigma minus an A, which means that the matter is de-excited, one photon is destroyed. And here, the sigma plus A data, which means the matter is excited, but then one photon comes up. So the energy doesn't seem to be concerned. But these, these terms come from the classical Hamiltonian. So, so they, when you quantize the classical Hamiltonian, they, they come out. In addition, there's, there's another uh, Hamiltonian term, the so-called A squared. This, is, this corresponds to the A squared term that I mentioned before. So all these become important. In the ultra strong coupling regime, and we collaborated with a theorist, Motoaki Bamba. He wrote down all the terms for the Hamiltonian. We were able to identify the uh, this CRI branch uh, to be an uh, evidence, spectroscopic evidence for the uh, the block Siegel shift, which is the um, yeah, evidence of rotating wave approximations broken, and furthermore. By changing the electron density in looking at different samples with different two data densities, we were able to demonstrate this Dicky cooperativity. So these were done in simple one-dimensional photonic crystal cavities, and recently we're using different types of cavities to explore different regimes. Uh, we're using nanoslot cavities, and we found that the now the, our linear spectrum changes with the, our, our spectrum changes with the intensity of the incident terahertz 
radiation. So when the intensity is very, very weak, now um, yeah, we, we see a large Rabi splitting, but then the Rabi splitting becomes smaller and smaller. It eventually disappears when we increase the uh, intensity of the incident light. So we are we're entering a new regime of nonlinear USC uh, ultrastrong coupling using this kind of metamaterial materials, uh, metamaterials to enhance electric fields. We're also using this kind of three-dimensional photonic crystal cavity. So the original motivation came from this particular theory paper. Um, this is to circumvent the Novo theorem. So the Novo theorem can be circumvented. According to these people, when you have non-uniform electromagnetic fields, okay? Uh, non-uniform non magnetic fields or periodic electromagnetic fields can be produced when you have a, a three-dimensional photonic crystal cavity. Um, yeah, so that, that's exactly what we have. Instead of just one-dimensional, we have the in-plane periodic structures. Uh, so we still sandwich uh, Gianni Moss and I to the sample with, with a pair of uh, mirrors, but each mirror is a wood pile of structure. And the yeah, this is a picture of the fabricated uh, the cavity structure. Um, and we did transmission spectroscopy to verify the existence of photonic band gap and the, the resonances. Um, in this kind of three dimensional photonic crystal, Cavity, there are multiple photonic nodes, multiple defects in the inside the cavity. This, this leads, leads to an interesting regime called the super strong coupling regime. I, I talked about the strong coupling regime, ultra strong coupling regime, and the deep strong coupling regime, but there's another regime called the Super strong. <laughs> uh, this, this happens when you have multiple modes. Okay? So the definition is very simple. Right? So you have, you have two photonic modes and a single matter mode interacting with, with two modes and then showing Rabi splitting with each photonic mode. But suppose what, uh, what happens when G becomes larger and larger and larger than the the intermode spacing. So, so super strong <laughs> happens when G becomes d larger than delta omega. This means that the, the individual Rabi splitting becomes larger, larger than the intermode separation. Okay? So in, in this regime, you cannot use a single mode uh, approximation. And it turns out that the, there are two scenarios the so-called the 2n scenario and the n plus 1 scenario. So the 2n scenario means that the, the different modes are independent, but even in this regime, the different modes are uh, independent of each other. So if you have two modes, they, they, there will be only four photonic uh, polaritonic branches. In the n plus 1 uh, scenario, then the the different photonic modes are strongly coupled. Um, so the when n is two, uh, there are only three uh, polaritonic branches. We skip all these. So the, we found that the we have the n plus one scenario, and we introduced this new figure of merit for uh, this. This simply becomes a g over omega naught if you have a single mode. But when you have multiple modes, you have subscripts P and P, P prime. And the, so eta one one and eta two two, so they, they, they are larger than 0 0.1, so we are definitely in this ultra strong coupling regime. But what we found uh, is that uh, all diagonal elements of this uh, index, Eta 1, 2, and 1, 2, they become larger than 1. This means that the, the correlation between different photonic modes is significant in the ground state of the system mediated by 
interaction with the same cycloton resonance. So the, in, the, the ground state contains correlations, correlated photon photon coupled states uh, in, in, in the theory. Uh, so almost, yeah, time is almost over. Almost over. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes. So I, I'll be very, very quick. Within a few minutes, I will finish. So the spin photon coupling, the, the reason why we, we like this is basically when you have a pyromagnet, it has a collection of spins. Okay? And the, uh, the spins are interacting with a single mode of cavity photons. If cavity, um, this really represents the original Dickey model. Okay? We have N spins. And they are interacting with a common electromagnetic mode. Um, yes. So we do we do electron paramagnetic resonance experiment as a function of magnetic field. This is 25 tesla. We have a very special magnet <coughs> called Rambo, uh, Rice advanced magnet with uh, broadband optics. And, uh, in the first generation of Rambo, we go to 30 tesla. We, now we are updating the system, we can now produce 50 tesla. Tabletop, tabletop magnet. But so they, yeah, basically, if you have such high magnetic fields, EPR comes into the terahertz range. That's why we, we need high magnetic fields instead of gigahertz. Is it continuous? Pulse. Pulse. Yeah, pulse magnet, okay. yes. So, but the pulse duration is uh, 10 milliseconds, but we do femtosecond spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. So, millisecond is infinite. <laughs> so EPR instead of cyclotron resonance. So the so the, the interesting thing one, one one just this is a, probably the last slide. So the yeah so the spin boson system the Dicky model but the G factor or the no light matter coupling we, depends on the temperature because if you can think you have a finite level system. Right? So if you let's say two two level atoms. When you, if you go to t equals zero, all the atoms can absorb. But at, at high temperature, some of the atoms are already excited, right? So the absorption is, is less. So the light matter coupling rate is temperature dependent. But if you have a boson boson system, like a phonon phonon photon, a magnon photon system, boson boson, basically, this is almost classical. You know, the interaction between two simple harmonic oscillators. Not very quantum, right? So that's why we, we like this system. It's, it's more quantum. Okay? That's why we started using spin boson couple of systems. And then we see interesting temperature demands. At, at, at high temperature, there's a single mode. And then at a critical temperature, it suddenly splits. This corresponds, this is an open quantum system and showing yeah, no emission system with a Exceptional point. There's a as a function of temperature. There's a exceptional point, and then it splits in, 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 into two. And the exceptional point is temperature dependent or magnetic field dependent. Yeah, so this is at 25 tesla. This is 20 tesla. Yeah, and then we can we can explain how the g factor uh, the light matter coupling rate is temperature. Yeah. Yeah, let me skip this. So we have a. Some preliminary results, BCS supercomputer. So the, the idea is we want to increase the temperature the transition temperature superconductor through coupling with vacuum. Yeah. So overall we are studying light dressed matter without light. It's just by placing in a cavity, we are studying of, uh, extreme domain optics with, with vacuum fields. We want to modify topology and we want to uh, manipulate superconductivity and ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism. In all this, we, yeah, we have a lot of tools. And the, let me skip these. Uh, yes, so yeah, these are the students and postdocs at, uh, in, in my group who did all, all, all these experiments and we, we have collaborators at. Yokohama National University in Japan, uh, CNRS, Strasbourg is a theorist, and the yeah, two-day examples came from Mike Mumford's group.
Purdue University, and these are the funding agencies for this project. Thank you very much for the Hey, thank you for the, your beautiful talk here. So let's open to the questions, please. Uh, thank you very much. I found your uh, e physics explanations excellent and very really intuitive, except one point which, which confused me. <laughs> you said that there is a large vacuum energy of 22 joules per cubic meter in uh, uh, vis visible range, and then you said we should be able to use this energy. <laughs> and then to illustrate this, you said, let's imagine cavity which doesn't have particular oscillation such that atom cannot interact with something. How is this example illustrating the usage of this 22 joule? Yeah, so the, obviously we, we cannot just take energy from the vacuum. So if, if we take energy from the quantum vacuum, we have to pay back. Yeah. So the, we cannot just take, take energy. Sure. So we, 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 have to, we have to do something. So one, one thing we're doing is, for example, this, this experiment I really wanted to talk about, actually. So this is, this is a quantum quench experiment. And so here, the purpose is to take energy from the back, take, uh, produce photons <coughs> from the vacuum. So, so converting virtual photons into real photons. So it looks like we, we are producing energy from the vacuum. but I, it's not because we, we need this incident force. So you, you have to drive the system, to quench the system, and then the, to produce real photons from vacuum. Photons. So we we'll always, uh, I mean, you, you have to pay. You, you, you cannot just yeah, take advantage of the Go for your existing. Life. <laughs> no, no. So is it kind of a parametric amplification with the, the vacuum fractions? I, th I think so. That, that's, that's the equivalent of this. I'll take the bait on the superconductivity. <laughs> so, do you have you have, did you observe evidence for the vacuum Le work effect? Oh, you know, you know this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I don't have the transport to that. Right. So the so in free space, it has been demonstrated that the, if you irradiate a superconductor with photons smaller than the, the BCS gap, actually you can modify the equilibrium distribution of quasi-particles that effectively increase the TC. That is called the Ilyashberg, or classical Ilyashberg. And there have been theoretical predictions about quantum, quantum Ilyashberg effect where you use a cavity whose photon frequency, resonance photon frequency is below the, the, the BCS to, to delta, that can, that's supposed to increase the, 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 the TC. So the uh, short answer to your question is no. <laughs> 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 we, we see something, we see something. We see, yeah. Are you going to the APS meeting? I won't be, but. Yeah, one of my students will be presenting. I see, I'll see. We see, yeah, so DC transport as a function of depth. Resistance versus temperature. Uh -huh. Inside the cavity, in free space, we see a small strip, okay. like mini, mini Kelvin. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yes. I was, I'm very intrigued by this quantum Hall effect experiment you yes. did. You showed you're modifying the quantum states. Can you, does that manifest in any way in affecting the quantum Hall effect? I mean, can you modify uh, the? Tra do you, I mean, do you measure and, and do you modify the, the transport? Right. In those in that strong coupling. Right. Yeah. So, so, the, so in terms of transport, I have a competing group. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Yes, I think this this paper, uh, Jerome Feist group. So they they are ahead of us. So they, they have already done, mm -hmm. and they they observed that the, the quantized value of the whole, whole coefficient indeed moves 
moves away from that. So it's no longer quantized. Then. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, they see that. So you really can see that you're modifying the yes, yes. nature of the of yes. the uh, factory state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But it's this. There's no theoretical understanding yet. It's it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very exciting topic. Any other questions? Yes, <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, you, you can imagine making your cavity, physically making it out of, say, a birefringent material that um, that is a cavity for one polarization, yes. one circular polarization, yes. and not a cavity for another, so yes. that you would break um, time reversal. Time reversal symmetry. symmetry. We're doing that right now. Yes, yeah. we, have a, we have a design. Yes. Yeah, for example, what, what, what that can do is, for example, you know, in free space, if, if you have graphene, and if you, if you irradiate graphene with, with a circular polarized laser beam, you can actually open a gap at the direct point, right? So you can go from this statement and open a gap with a circular polarization. So what we're trying to do is to make a chiral cavity, which hosts only one circular polarization. And then we place a graphene sheet in the middle that will open again. That, that, yeah, what we are we are working on. Any other questions? Not. Thank you, Colonel.